Welcome to Quantum Mechanics, a powerful framework for understanding the universe. Hello everybody. Today we're going to start Chapter 1, The Mathematical Structure of Quantum Mechanics. Chapter 1 has five sections, vector spaces and inner products, linear operators, self-adjoint linear operators, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, Dirac notation, and projection operators in the spectral theorem. So we'll have a lecture over each topic. All right, we're going to start with the definition of a vector space and an inner product. Now this is something that you're probably familiar with, but what I'm gonna introduce here is I want to write down the abstract definition of vector space. You're used to vector spaces, say, R3, the space of uh, three tuples of real numbers, Rn even. Um, but in quantum mechanics, we're going to look at uh, much more general examples of vector spaces. Vector spaces constructed from functions, vector spaces constructed from matrices. And so it's helpful to have the general definition at hand so that you can refer back to it. Basically, a vector space is a collection of objects we call them vectors, that have the property that um, we have a way of adding two of those objects and getting another vector in the space and multiplying them by scalars, complex numbers in this case, and getting another vector in the space. And these properties of, uh, of vector addition and scalar multiplication satisfy certain consistency properties that uh, are written down in the, uh, in the definition. So we don't need to spend too much time with that at the moment, but this is a very important property, the notion of an inner product. We're going to start putting structure on the space. So an inner product um, is a way of associating with any two, two vectors, phi and psi, a complex number. Now, it's an ordered pair, phi comma, psi comma phi, sorry, psi comma phi. And we, we put that ordered pair in, in uh, round brackets at the moment, and so that, that sets it off as, a, as, a, as an independent block. Uh, psi comma phi is a complex number, and the inner product satisfies these three properties. All right. So it's important that you, uh, let's start with the last pro property first, last to first. Okay, um, the inner product of a vector with itself is greater than or equal to zero. It's zero only if the vector is zero. The inner product of phi with psi with phi is equal to the complex conjugate of the inner product of, of phi with psi, reversed, okay? That's going to be important. Um, remember that the inner product is a complex number. It associates with any two um, vectors a complex number. The order is important. But now pay particular close attention to this first property, okay? In the rightmost entry of the inner product, we have a linear combination of phi with chi, alpha phi plus beta chi. That's what I mean by linear combination. We add the vectors and they multiply by scalars and this combination is linear combination. Okay, so I, I highlighted that, that uh, first property for a reason. I'll come back to that in a second. But while we're at it, the inner product can be used to create another structure which measures the length or the magnitude of a vector. And that's called the norm. So the norm, we say the norm induced by the inner product, the norm of psi, vector psi, and we denote that with double vertical bars on either side, is the square root of the inner product of that vector with itself. Okay, norms are going to be very important because 
we are going to be dealing with vectors which we have which we have unit length unit norm and we can always make them provided that they're finite their norm is finite we can always make them uh, have unit length by dividing that vector by the real number which is the norm of that vector and that way we said that the vector has been normalized normalization is extremely important so with the norm, we can also do other things. The norm measures the size of vectors. We can take the difference of two vectors and we can use the norm to decide how close those two vectors happen to be. And you you've ha are familiar with the notion of sequences of either numbers or functions. We can look at the norm of the difference of two adjacent elements in the sequence. And if they get closer and closer together, that we refer to that as a Cauchy sequence. Cauchy sequences are important. And we can talk about convergence in the norm. Okay. A complex inter inner product. Remember I said look at that first property in the definition of an inner product. In the first property, the in the, in the definition, the linear combination of the two vectors was in the right-hand side. When we pulled out the scalars, we just pulled them out and nothing happened to them. But if it happens to be in the left-hand side, using the fact that the if we reverse the order, we get we incur a complex conjugate. If we pull out the scalars, in that case, we get a we have to take their complex conjugate. Now, I didn't say that in the best possible way, which maybe is good because it means you're going to need to want to go and understand this calculation equation uh, 1.2 very thoroughly and compare it with the properties of the inner product. This is one way in which you can get uh, the, the, uh, the inner product properties can get confused a bit. Okay, there's a famous inequality uh, that enables us to bound the inner product in terms of two vectors in terms of the norm of the two vectors. It's called the Schwartz inequality or the Cauchy Schwartz inequality or the Cauchy Bunyakovsky Schwartz inequality. And we will see how this is used in some applications um, in. Um, Chapter 2. Now I include a proof in the book, but I'm not going to examine you on the proof. I just include it here for completeness. The philosophy of this course is going to be to do calculations, not to prove theorems. The only time we will prove a theorem is when it teaches us something important about doing a calculation. Now, two examples of complex vector spaces. These are going to be the two most important examples for the course in some sense. So it's important that you understand these from the start. So Cn is a space of n tuples of complex numbers. So if we take the inner product of 2, x is an n tuple of complex numbers, y, it's just the product of the given n tuples in the order in which they come in both vectors, but it's important that the entry on the left, x, we take the complex conjugate of each n-tuple. So pay attention to that. Now another example is a space of complex value. I said we're dealing with complex quantities in quantum mechanics. Uh, functions of real variables on some subset of the line. And we want them to have a certain property that if we take the absolute the magnitude squared the complex value and we integrate it over the domain that is finite and we call these square because of the two square integrable functions integrable because the integral exists and we make that into a a vector space by consider considering the sum of two vectors is their pointwise values. The sum of two functions is their evaluated at a point 
is their point by y value at that point. Okay. Now, how do we put an inner product on that function space? <clears throat> Here's our general definition for or notation for inner product. And so the inner product of these two functions, psi with phi, is the integral of the function on the left. We take its complex conjugate, psi bar phi, integrated over the domain. All right, then we have a number of concepts which I think you're familiar with, so I will, I will um, go over them rather quickly and we can discuss them in more detail in, um, in the lecture, the problem sessions. The notion of a basis. The basis of a vector space is a set of linearly independent vectors that have the property that any vector in that space can be represented as a linear combination of those vectors. It has just the right amount. You add a vector to it and it's not linear independent. You subtract a vector from that basis and you can no longer represent any vector in the space by a linear combination. All right, bases are crucial in quantum mechanics. In fact, it's not an exaggeration to say that your success in solving a problem in quantum mechanics often it occurs by choosing the right basis. Now what right basis means is um, we're going to learn about that in a number of examples throughout the course. Okay, we talked about convergence of sequences and Cauchy sequences earlier when we talked about what we could do with the norm. That gives us an example of why the norm is important. And so we end with a couple of definitions. First of all, the notion of Hilbert space. That You hear that a lot. So a Hilbert space is a vector space with an inner product that has the property that every Cauchy sequence in that vector space is converges to a vector in that vector space. We say it's complete in that sense. Now often in, in applications, I mean, you, you hear, you think of Hilbert spaces often introduced as an infinite dimensional, an infinite number of basis vectors describing that. That doesn't have to be the case. It's just a vector space with an inner product um, that is complete in this sense. Now the reason that's important is we're going to talk about the notion of the state space and state vectors of a quantum mechanical system. So the state. Um, in, in ODE2 you had the notion of phase space of a dynamical system. This is this is very this is similar in some sense. Okay, the state space of a quantum mechanical system is a complex Hilbert space, and that's it. And that's a lot of physics is going to be based on that. So a state vector of a quantum mechanical system is a vector in that state space of unit magnitude. So it's been normalized. Okay. This is an important point. Why do we insist on normalization? You, 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 will, you will learn about that, but in the first chapter, I'm just gonna kind of beat it into your head. Normalize, normalize, normalize. Okay, so any two vectors correspond to the same state if they uh, differ up to a, a multiplicity factor of complex number. So we can think of a a line or a ray positive in Hilbert space uh, and all the lines all, all the points along that ray corresponding to, to the state the same state vector now that was probably a bit abstract at this point but we will we will see exactly what we mean when we start normalizing and really where that is where it really normalization comes to play is when we when we have a physical interpretation for what quantum mechanics means in some sense. Okay, that takes us to the end of section one. Section two,
picks up with linear operators. We're going to use we're going to use everything we developed in chapter one to develop this notion of linear operators. And I hope things were fairly clear. You have the book and you're going to have me to discuss these things with. What I really what what you need to do is go through everything we've discussed and think of a question to ask me about everything. And we will go over these in the problem sessions and in the period after the lectures when we can have discussions about the material. Okay. Thanks everybody for your attention. Remember, you can get this by subscribing to my YouTube channel, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.